Okay, cool. So again, uh, thanks for coming to part two. Uh, last time we focused on writing clean code and kind of different ways to uh, improve your code with just some real simple practices, things like adopting a coding style. Doesn't really matter which one you choose, kind of just as long as you apply it consistently uh, throughout your code base. Uh, we also talked about naming things and how that can be difficult, but you can kind of start to wrangle that down by avoiding abbreviations, um, trying to choose kind of proper names that relay context, not necessarily um, things that can be inferred in other ways like data types. Um, and over time, how you'll kind of build up a vocabulary or a word bank that you can use and it'll make naming things not so hard and it'll become easy. And then also we talked about uh, avoiding nested code. So simple ways to kind of leverage um, ifs and else's and logic and returns to kind of um, keep that indentation level, you know, really um, non-existent or even, um, you know, just down to one or two levels at the most. So today in part two, what I wanna focus on is grouping. And another piece of feedback I got, oh, let me finish sharing the screen. Um, another piece of feedback I got was that people uh, kind of wanted to see a little bit of an agenda. So um, I wrote this out here just a little bit, just kind of high level. So what we're gonna cover today is grouping. And basically what I mean by grouping is one of the pillars of object-oriented programming, which is basically uh, encapsulation. Uh, and what we mean by that is basically different ways that we can take code and kind of organize it and structure it uh, where things that are related to themselves are kind of in one spot and things that are related uh, maybe to other things are in a different spot. And we kind of create these buckets or groups or uh, structures within our code. So sometimes this can be really high level. Uh, for example, in, in Laravel, um, I know a lot of you are familiar with Laravel, but it's an MVC framework. So, you know, grouping is as simple as putting the models, the M uh, in one place, putting the views in another place, putting uh, C, the controllers uh, in a place. So that's an, a very high level example of grouping. Um, the other point, though, that I got uh, as some feedback is uh, people want to see more code samples, which I love. I, I really love code samples. I think code is really what drives home a point. Um, so show me the code. Uh, I'm going to do that. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is kind of use grouping to improve communication. So this is the very big thing. This is paramount to writing, writing clean code, right? This is what I'm really trying to advocate is uh, code that's readable, uh, is code that's going to be easier to kind of understand and therefore uh, easier to maintain, which is really the biggest thing, right? And whether it's just you maintaining the code or a team of developers or a future team of developers, um, really focusing down, I found on that, on, on simply that readability, just that one thing uh, really has benefits that kind of permeate to a lot of other things. That, that to me is kind of the core thing that you can work on and, and really change uh, your code and, and um, you know, make it clean, right? So we'll use the previous example to kind of work on improving communication by using uh, grouping. Uh, and then I wanna talk a little bit more about a, a more, I guess, a more advanced, or at least relative to last time, more advanced pieces like how we can group uh, data. So ways to kind of encapsulate data uh, into structures that make them kind of easier to use and, and reason about as well as communicate. And then also uh, just some tricks and real simple ways to kind of organize your code that might help it be a little cleaner. So let's jump right in with uh, improving communication. And again, I'm gonna use our example from last time. So this is kind of that after example. Um, so we saw before, and, and again, the screenshot from the website. This is kind of this real world code sample that, that I found uh, a couple weeks ago. And I kind of went in and, and refactored and reworked and, and cleaned it up, uh, if you will, to kind of become this. Um, this was also a blog post, uh, and a lot of the comments from not only last time, but the blog posts and on Twitter, um, and even just kind of generally from the website, uh, people were saying, oh, well, you can, you know, you can do some more to improve the readability here. And I totally agree. So let's, let's talk about that. Um, a lot of people were basically suggesting that, okay, you can make this a, a one line uh, return, right? And you can do that by kind of improving the communication of some of these sections here. So for example, let's start up top. Um, this check, it's easy to read as any developer, right? It's something that I can kind of figure out, especially if I'm familiar with um, Laravel in this case, I can understand that auth user, this first part is gonna give me back uh, a user and then I'm able to call a method on that user 
uh, object has role and check for admin. Um, but there's some pieces there that I have to know. And again, if you're not familiar with Laravel or, or maybe the code's kind of written in a different way, there's ways to improve the communication here. And what we can do is basically take this and extract that off into a function. So real simple stuff here. Let's just say uh, a real simple kind of helper method here uh, and we'll call it is admin. And I'm just gonna create that. And we're just gonna basically move that code down here. And we've kind of grouped all that and we've extracted it all away. Let me run my little formatter, keep everything clean. And now we can see that again, a real quick example of just a small way to kind of break that code out and set it up in a way that communicates better, right? I don't have to know kind of the inner workings uh, of the way it's done. I don't have to know the implementation details. Uh, this may be a nice little, again, helper method that kind of takes that code, sends it off. It also improves that readability. And we can continue applying that. Uh, let's just do it one more time here to get the example. Um, so just to drive it home, we could do something like is owner. Um, and we'll pass in the user ID. And we'll create this function. Oops. Let's learn to type is owner. And I'll just paste that down here. Let's make sure we pass in that user ID. Oh, there was a bug someone noted from last time, or really just a syntax mistake. This should have been ID. Um, so again, checking the user's ID against the user ID. So provided that you're the owner, um, you're able to um, kind of, again, improve communication and uh, group that logic off into another place. Now, some people were actually taking uh, these and grouping them out into methods that were like uh, has scope. Um, but I thought that was a little bit uh, difficult because really what you end up having, and, and I guess this is to prove that there's a limit to um, kind of grouping these things out, right? Um, you would have to pass the scope and then you'd also have to pass what you wanna test against. And just to kind of play that out for a second, if we make this method has scope um, and we pass in, you know, kind of like, uh, let's just say source. And again, I don't want to get caught up on naming things. I can come back once I have more context. Uh, but basically we would return a comparison that source uh, was equal to uh, the destination and go from there. So again, not the best names, uh, but since we're not going to play this through, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that alone for a second. So we could apply this down here too, where it was, um, oh, sorry, that was public. Uh, we could apply this down here too, and we could say has scope private. I don't think we've really gained anything here. So that's where the limit stops for me. Uh, if scope was some kind of object where we were able to call scope, um, you know, has scope, and then we could simply pass uh, public. To me, that would be a little cleaner API. Uh, that would be something that I think afforded some readability. Um, but this original version here hasn't gained us much in kind of this procedural land that we're in now. Again, if, if we had some objects, if we did some other things, which we're going to look at here in a little bit, I might go so far as to push uh, for some grouping uh, to improve uh, kind of the readability, to improve the, the encapsulation of the code. But I don't think this method affords us as much as the others. Um, so we can talk about that more uh, later uh, through the questions and so forth. But it's one of those situations where is admin definitely is, is relaying something right off the bat, has scope where I pass it the scope in public. I'm not gaining anything by, by simply just doing um, this original check in my opinion. So just some examples of, you know, we want a group to improve communication, but we don't necessarily want to turn every single um, expression uh, or assignment or anything into their own, own um, functions or methods. We can see that that doesn't scale very well, right? In the end, we would end up with um, a lot more where um, the sum uh, was kind of greater than the individual parts. Um, so that's kind of the upper bound, and we'll explore that some more later on. So uh, that is improving communication. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about data. I think these are kind of the fun ones. And what we're talking about here is actually um, trying to get into a code smell that's actually listed and what it's called is primitive obsession. And what that means is uh, obviously as developers, the first thing we learn about, the first types of data types that we learn about are the really simple data types, um, integers, strings, um, you know, even maybe in PHP, for example, uh, arrays, right? 
uh, we don't really have too many other data types than those. Uh, they're not necessarily objects, right? These are kind of the base data types or what's called primitives. And what we'll end up doing is, you know, we kind of use those a lot, right? We're kind of obsessed with them. That's what we know. And so we never really think, oh, well, we can kind of group that data together to create a, a more um, interesting maybe object, right? Or, or something that again, relays that information better. And one of the reasons for doing this again, and one of the reasons for grouping in general, is that let's look at a few of these examples and, and kind of see um, you know, how we can improve them, right? And so for example, plot, um, we pass what are perceived here as coordinates, right? X, Y, and Z. And the naming of these and, and kind of that plot analogy lets us kind of gather some information, uh, right? But again, to the point of grouping, uh, this data really is related to itself, right? Our code's not relaying that because we've chosen to simply pass in, you know, these integers, uh, three of them, right? But there's a better way to kind of relay uh, the intent of X, Y, and Z here. That data changes at the same time and therefore can easily be grouped in a, in a capsulated uh, into something else. And in this case, uh, and, and as the smell kind of um, hints at, it's one of those things where it might be a little cleaner to actually uh, pass in, for example, a new point, right? Or a new coordinate or a new 3D point, uh, whatever we might do. Uh, but now we've afforded ourselves uh, improved communication, right? By kind of saying, oh, XYZ truly is a point. You don't have to guess, um, even though it, it's not a stretch to make that assumption. It's one of those things where we can make this class and I'm just gonna auto generate it here real quick. Um, or no, I'm not, because that's gonna go down here. But the point is, the point about the point is inside of this class, we now have the ability to make all sorts of other methods uh, that could later be helpful to uh, things that are related instead of having to make all these like uh, small little functions. So again, one of those things where by taking that leap and moving away from primitives, now we've kind of paved this road to encapsulate not just this data into a very simple data object, but now we can grow that class out to make more methods that might help related to a uh, point. And we kind of start to make that leap if we haven't already towards object-oriented programming, right? Because if you only ever use primitives, you're kind of stuck to always using functions and very procedural code. Uh, so again, let's drive this home with some more examples. Uh, let's say for instance, that you have this transfer method and you wanna transfer what, again, from the variable and the naming looks like uh, some kind of money, right? You wanna transfer it between an account or whatever. There's gonna be an amount and a currency related to that money. But we can group these up by, again, creating uh, an object that better expresses uh, our intent of use, right? Better expresses that these are a unit, right? They're related to each other and they're gonna change kind of at the same time. I, I really shouldn't change the currency without changing the amount, for example, right? Um, in a way they're immutable to each other. And so we can kind of push those concepts, we can relay communication by just adding some, uh, just introducing a very simple value object, right? In this case, money. So finally, another really good one, I think in PHP and one that you'll see in other languages, I know for example, Objective-C um, does this throughout, uh, but in PHP, uh, it's very common to see things like uh, a lot of the string methods have start and end, um, primitives that are sent in, right? They're just integer values um, that can be positive or negative and do very different things. But the point is, is that they're always kind of passed in together, right? I, I want this piece of the string. I want this substring of it. And we can actually change this again uh, to introduce what's called a range object. And a range object is like super helpful. And we're actually gonna power this through for a second, but I can make a range and change that signature. And let's just change this to range and kind of demonstrate the point. So as I was talking about earlier, we can have more methods that get put on here. So a lot of the times with start and end, um, it's very flat. And so we would have to do if statements to see like, oh, is something before, uh, you know, is something within that range, right? But if I have this class now, not only do I get the range object that communicates and I can pass it around easier, but now I have a place to put things that are related um, to management of a range, right? So for example, if I wanted to make a method on the range class, maybe called uh, within, right? 
And this simply returns uh, true or false. So I can do something like return, um, let's pass it in uh, some kind of position or index, I guess would be the, the right thing there for a string. It's a pretty common name. So we can basically say, look, is index um, you know, greater than or equal to uh, this thing's start, whoops, uh, or is it um, less than or equal to uh, this? I don't have the constructor built here, so I'm having to type all this out by hand, but hopefully it relays the idea. We can probably just alt enter our way to happiness here. So let's create a property. Oops. Sorry. Field. That's better. There we go. One more. Maybe not. All right. Thank you, PHP Storm. All right, cool. So anyways, the point here is that we could do something like this within without having to take this same logic and put it everywhere else in all of these um, string methods that were string functions that we're building, right? So imagine how many uh, string functions are in PHP. There, there's probably at least 50 that use things like start and end. But by introducing a very simple value object to kind of group that data, that data that changes in a related way, right? The start and end and turning it into a range, we've afforded ourselves not only the communication, but now the ability to add really interesting methods that can be helpful when I want to use that, that range object anywhere in my code, right? So, and that's not only the, the leap from procedural to objective, um, you know, programming, but also, or sorry, ob object oriented programming, but also, um, you know, the whole point at its root of again, grouping and, and, and kind of making the code potentially um, easier to reason about and, and easier to manage. So, that is range, uh, which I think is really interesting. There's a lot of blog posts. Martin Fowler's got a really good one on the range object, which I'll share, but he kind of basically goes into these, these exact same points. Um, he kind of takes them a lot farther than I have, but um, same concept here, and that's called the range object. So generally these are called um, just value objects. They're really simple ways. Uh, you know, you've probably heard them um, called POJOs in, in Java, for example, or POPOs in, uh, in PHP. Uh, so those are plain old PHP objects, P-O-P-O, -P -O, um, or whatever language you're using. So uh, Java, POJO, plain old Java object. So again, a lot of times there's nothing special about these um, objects. They're just data holders uh, to group that data that changes in the same way. But it affords you these really nice things in programming. Again, the money object would afford you things like immutability. Um, having a range object allows you to kind of encapsulate all of those um, range functions that could be helpful within using a range um, and kind of keep those nice, tightly organized into a class. So that is data encapsulation. And finally, let's talk a little bit about organizing code. So I've broken out this user object here and let me just make it a little easier to kind of reason about by folding it here. Um, okay, so this is a standard user object. Um, it's, it's really a model in this case. And if you're familiar with models, a lot of the times what you'll see on models are these find, create, save, and destroy methods. Um, things that basically interact uh, with uh, a database or some kind of persistent storage uh, where you want to be um, pulling this data out from, giving it kind of an object representation, and then maybe doing some things with it, um, and ultimately either saving it or destroying it. Um, but we have some other methods that are in here. And so I wanna talk a little bit about how can we kind of go through our code to clean it up and um, kind of group these in ways that make a little bit more sense. So there's kind of two things I do when I feel like my class is getting a little bit crazy. Um, it's getting a little large. There's some things in here that maybe don't make sense, or I feel like, you know, I'm starting to get this, uh, get the idea that they belong somewhere else. Um, the first thing I'll do is I'll go through and make a pass and see, okay, um, do any of my method names uh, kind of hint at being already pre-grouped. Like for example, if, I, if I'm prefixing anything. So I've made kind of this contrived example here, of course, uh, but we can see immediately that a lot of these um, have to do with uh, display. There's a lot of things in here that I'm messing with. It looks like, uh, you know, doing things that take parts of this data and they represent kind of a, a display format, if you will. Um, that's maybe possibly, for example, used by the view. 
and we could go do some research and figure that out and, and obviously a, a full-fledged application. But for now, what I'll do is, is I'll kind of look through and see, okay, um, do I have any prefixes? Are there any names, uh, method names that are really similar? And I'll kind of group those all up in the class and I'll take a look at those. So we've already, I've already kind of done that here in the interest of time, but we see immediately that display name, display method signature, or sorry, display signature and display salutation um, are all kind of about basically string concatenation. They're, they're kind of doing the same thing. They're just working on this object. So I want to take those and make another object out of them. They don't really belong here. There's, there's another place that they could be. And clearly their focus is on doing, even though it is working on the user and its data, um, it's not necessarily related to the core intent of, of the model, right? It's not related to necessarily um, the object's representation uh, and its management through persistent store, right? This has to do more with formatting this object for some other type of display. So I'm gonna take these out. And a lot of the times when I find particularly these types of display methods, I'll make some kind of presenter class. So I'll call it like user uh, presenter. And basically I'll take these same methods and I'll have to alter their signature just a little bit to where basically I pass in uh, the user object because they're no longer part of that class. And now I can change this up to where, there we go. And they're basically moved out somewhere else. And I've tidied up this class, but I've also made a new home for um, presentation logic that's related to the, to the user. And it's quite possible this maybe doesn't even need to be specifically related to the user. There's possible, uh, there could be some kind of like user interface or some name interface just to kind of drive home the point that has first name and last name on it. Uh, it could be all sorts of different types of, of things. It doesn't have to be a user. It could be an admin. It could be a guest. Um, as long as they have a first and last name and we create some kind of, some kind of interface for that, um, we could make this a lot more robust. Uh, so this presenter could do more things than just be for the user. Uh, but for now, it's only for the user. So we'll just keep it this way to avoid um, kind of pushing down a road that, that we're not on yet. Uh, and then finally, the next thing that I'll do, uh, and this one still applies, but sometimes you won't be so lucky that all of them are, are uh, variable, like our method names are the same way. So what I look at is our method signature. So if I see that a lot of methods are concerned uh, with using uh, X, Y, and Z, for example, or using uh, amount and currency, um, or in this case, uh, using some kind of printer object, um, right away, I'll kind of see if there's if there's a handful of those, if there's kind of a critical mass, uh, I'll try to take those and, and also, again, put those somewhere else. So this create badge um, and print badge, uh, again, they work on the user object, but right away, based on their signature and even the fact that they do share some of the name, they too could be broken out somewhere else. So we can simply take those out, move those into some kind of badge printer, uh, and effectively continue to clean up and focus the use of the user model class while introducing some other classes that make it, whoops, make it a little easier to group that code and, and work with and kind of build out on in the future. So it's pretty much uh, that straightforward. And now uh, this printer, again, we would kind of flip this on its head. So now we would pass it a user and printer could uh, theoretically just become something that is part of this badge printer class. We don't actually have to uh, bring it in anymore. Uh, it would just be instantiated and, and created uh, when you actually uh, created this badge printer, right? You would pass it into that. So now you just pass this object. So there's two things that basically happened here in, in these refactors. We extracted common methods, either by looking at uh, simply their name or their function. Uh, method signatures uh, are also another good way to kind of find things that are related. Uh, we possibly organize them in the code so they're easier to look at and easier to kind of just take and move away. And then the next part of that kind of refactor is basically making sure that we flip their context, right? Since they're no longer within the user class, we need to make sure to now properly pass in the user and anything that maybe was passed in before could possibly be part of that object now. So for example, printer for the badge printer instead of passing it in could simply be uh, a field on this class or a property on this class that gets set up in a different way. 
So that is the last little grouping bit I wanted to show. Pretty, pretty uh, straightforward today. I want to leave more time for questions. Um, but those are the three different ways to group. So uh, again, our goal here is to kind of encapsulate things uh, in order to improve communication. We can do that uh, not only with data uh, in the case of, where's our little data class? Here it is. So in the case of introducing really simple value objects, uh, like point, money, range in these examples that allow us to expand upon those classes and, and add helper methods without having to litter our code, um, you know, Litter these uh, kind of throughout all of the code, all of the substring and, you know, string start and string end kind of methods. Uh, and then finally, we can also look at existing classes and, you know, use tools like naming conventions and method signatures to figure out, does this code really belong here? Or maybe is it better served somewhere else? Um, and again, for really large classes, this is, this is something that uh, you might want to consider doing you know, every now and then when you get in there, I'm sure we've all had that feeling before where it's like, man, this class is getting like really large, like where else can I put this? Um, so those are some tools to, to help you organize that as well. So with that, let me jump back over to Slack. We'll see if there's any kind of questions coming through and we will go from there. Do you use type hint? Okay, um, so yeah, so type hint, uh, for example, over here, we could say something like, um, user, and this would be a type hint. Uh, we could also do something here, uh, maybe like integer. Um, I don't think I have PHP Storm configured to, to do seven, uh, PHP seven where that was introduced. But uh, yes, sometimes I do use type hints. Um, I'm not necessarily like one way or the other. I know some people are really strict about um, using them or not using them. I think uh, to the point of communication, which is what I'm focused on. I do think there are times where having the type hint does help uh, communicate, right? Maybe not so much in this integer case, but I do think down here, um, especially if this were some kind of interface, that would be pretty nice to, to know that like, hey, I don't necessarily have to be a user. I might just have to be um, a person, you know, some, something, some kind of object that has a name. Um, and that would allow me to, to have a base class or an interface or something here to kind of hint at that. And I think that better communicates. Um, even though the variable name may be the, the very same as what the class is, um, having that extra little type hint, I, I think, helps in this case. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, back and forth uh, about, you know, using them and not using them and their real value and whatnot. Um, but from strictly a communication standpoint, I feel like uh, they can be helpful. Um, but I, again, I don't, as you can see, um, I don't kind of put them everywhere in the code. Uh, let's see, any other questions? Audio is a bit choppy. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I do think, I did notice from the video last time, uh, the, the, um, my internet connection might not be powerful enough for the HD, so I might have to bump that down next time. We'll give a few more minutes for questions. When do you decide it's time to extract a function? All right, good question. Um, which one of these examples, let's get a little more clarity here. Which one of these examples do you feel um, kind of makes the most sense? Are you referring more to maybe these guys, like why we broke things out of the user class? Or are we talking back kind of at the very beginning more like these types of functions? At the beginning, yeah, that one's a lot more subjective. So I think that's a good question. Um, I think it really boils down to me. Um, I probably would look at two things. Um, first, I would look at kind of the rule of three. Um, and so what the rule of three is, is basically after kind of um, three times of doing something, you have a pretty good handle on um, it being used and you have proof that it, it is something that can reasonably be shared. And at that point in time, you would you would take um, you know make the effort to extract it right. Um, there's a really fun uh, kind of code or mathematical sequence. I like to prove that. So um, just to kind of demonstrate the rule of three here, um, let's just say we have a sequence, and I say something like two, and then what's next, right? And we can all make some guesses about what's next. Um, you know, 
and I'm sure I can jump in Slack and, and let you guys make some choices there. But the point is, is that uh, I can do two of them and do a question mark. And, and we might, again, be at a place where we more reasonably can kind of guess at, at what the next one is. Um, but if we go now here, I think by the third one, uh, we have a, a pretty high chance of guessing that the next thing here, we can see the sequence of us, uh, you know, kind of squaring uh, things and, and kind of working from there, right? Uh, whereas before here, we could have guessed three, you know, here we could have guessed six. Um, we may or may not have been right, but the chance of success after three uh, is, is pretty high. So to the point in relating that back to code, um, if I was doing something like this check in three or four places, uh, or even this check in three or four places, it might be something at that point in time that I would want to extract it out. So the rule of three is kind of the first uh, definite driver for me. And then below that, I think a, a lesser rule. And the reason I never did this uh, in the very first time when we went through in part one um, and I didn't make is admin, but uh, communication would, would be the second thing. Um, so in this case, if for some reason I felt like this just read complex um, and even if it was only one place I was using it, if for some reason that just was a really interesting calculation and it made sense for me to take that and kind of move it somewhere else and give it a proper name um, that would be also when I would choose to extract it but it doesn't always have to be extracted to a function this could be easily extracted to um, even simply a variable and some people don't like temp variables but again if that uh, variable name that simple grouping an extraction just to a variable name and not necessarily a whole other function um, if that allowed me to kind of properly relay uh, and communicate better what I was doing, then that would be fine too. So, so really, uh, long story short, rule of three is, is the biggest uh, motivator for me to break something out into its own function. And then I think kind of a, a distant second uh, would be, you know, maybe if a variable name just wasn't enough. Um, and I really wanted to drive it home with kind of a, encapsulating that into its own method to improve communication or to group that code. Um, I would go there. All right, uh, I'll take a couple other questions if anybody has them. And if not, then we will cut it off for there. Another one, okay, cool. How do you decide whether to extract to a function or a class? I think it depends um, entirely on what it is already. So I don't really have a class to abstract, um, you know, this is admin stuff too necessarily. Um, I suppose I, I could go move that into the user class initially um, if I wanted to kind of pull that off so I could I could do something more like um, user, you know, is admin and I would just move it down there. So you could, in this case, not do a function um, and just go straight to some other object. Um, and then down the road, you know, you could always clean that up in other ways. Uh, I guess for me... Um, I jump to the object only if uh, one kind of already exists. I'm not going to make a whole class um, just to support is admin, for example. Um, I would just make a real simple helper method if I felt the need um, based on what we already talked about. So jumping not only to, um, you know, taking one little piece of code and going all the way to a brand new class and um, a method inside of that class is a pretty big leap in, in mind. That's, that's like three or four steps, right? Versus just, um, you know, one or two steps to make a function. So um, that would kind of be the leap for me. But if an object that makes sense already existed, by all means, I would, I would go straight to that object. Um, I wouldn't make any kind of um, helper function in, in between. So like for scope. Oh yeah, I got you. Yeah, that's a good example. Um, so yeah, earlier we were talking about creating kind of this has scope function and that seemed a little bit weird. Um, so again, we, we could go so far that, you know, scope was um, somehow an object and, and you could say something like, uh, you know, has um, public, right? And so if scope were an object, we could add this kind of has or this check or this verify, um, method um 
on inside of that class to check for public. Uh, but again, that's a lot of steps, right? I got to now go back to all my code, make it a scope object. Uh, then I have to make the scope class. Then I have to make this has method. And then I can go back and update all that, all that other code. So again, I probably would try to find a way uh, in this case, is there something better that should be doing all of this, right? Like, again, it's that whole situation where, especially with procedural code, once you kind of start cracking at it, um, you get in the situation where you kind of have to like sometimes fully move it over to OOP and that, that can be a pretty big effort, right? So it's one of those things where, again, I, just to kind of pick at this a little bit, um, I would probably leave it very simple, um, very simple at first, meaning procedural. Um, I wouldn't try to make that whole leap. Uh, but yes, by all means, if scope was an object already, um, there, there would be some ways to kind of clean this up where I wasn't doing kind of these primitive inline checks. But given the fact that I'm already working with primitives, making a full on leap to, to make all of this OOP by creating, you know, a scope class, by creating some kind of permission class or permission checker, that starts to seem a, a little too far to me. All right, uh, any other questions? I'm sure you got more PHP Pirate. Oh man, all right, I'm gonna take one more years, but I, I'm gonna see if, uh, if anybody else has one real quick before, uh, before I take this last one. I'll give you guys just a second, let me take a drink. All right, let's put this um, kind of back to a place real fast while people are coming up with additional questions. Just want to take this back. Okay, so has scope is fine, but that should have been public. All right, so this is actually um, somewhat relative to what it used to be. Come on, people. <laughs> uh, it's all right. We got a smaller group today. I think uh, the videos um, have kind of given people reason to be like, oh, I'll just wait and watch the video. So I appreciate you guys watching it live. Um, but yeah, maybe if this continues to be a trend, I'll just um, I'll just kind of do the videos and release them occasionally. Uh, but yes, I know. I know uh, some of you love asking the questions live, so uh, no problem at all. I mean, I enjoy it, so it's not a big deal. Uh, but yeah, okay. Let's answer these uh, these last two questions, and then we'll uh, we'll kind of cut it off for today. Uh, can you see yourself doing like a live pair program, cleaning up someone else's real code? Um, yes. Yeah, I think that would be a good one. Um, so it's a good suggestion, not not so much of a question, but yeah, um, maybe what we can do for some future sessions uh, is get some code samples. Um, you know, again, it's it would be a little difficult uh, to to be in a situation where you know you kind of wouldn't need the whole code base to kind of start looking at something. But but yeah, let me come up with some rules um, on what kind of code I would be looking for. And then maybe next time what we can do is, is kind of apply that to two or three code samples like um, uh, real time. So um, for those as a treat for those that showed up today for the, for the live session, thank you. Uh, and so what I'll do is um, you all, if you all have, I'll give you all first priority. So if you all have uh, some code samples, try to make them, you know, let's say less than 100 lines. Um, but if you have a section of code that you want cleaned up and you can give me kind of a description about what that code does, um, go ahead and send me a DM in Slack. And basically I'll choose three of those and we'll do another workshop next time and kind of apply some, some general live code cleanup. How does that sound? With tests. Um, yeah, if you have tests, uh, that's awesome. I probably won't necessarily do them uh, in the live cleanup. Um, just because I'll need your whole project to run it and stuff. So just in the interest of time, I, I might try to just focus on just the code. But uh, testing is something I ultimately want to get to. It's probably two or three workshops away. Um, but I, I do want to kind of start doing some workshops on on testing. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to get into that space a little bit. Um, so it seems like we got a couple people saying some stuff. So I'll, I'll take the last few questions here and then we'll shut it off. All right, seems to be no more typing. Okay, so yeah, so again, thanks for coming out today. Um, so yeah, send me uh, your code sample. Again, try to keep it a, a little bit tidy, um, you know, maybe within about 100 lines and give me just a couple sentence description on what it is. If you DM those to me, I will um, schedule the next workshop around um, cleaning up code, your code, <laughs> uh, live, and we'll just kind of iteratively go through it 
and uh, I'll kind of apply the practices that we've learned so far and maybe even just some new things and we'll kind of see how that goes. I think that would be fun. So, um, all right, y'all. Well, thanks for coming out and um, I'll, I'll finish answering the rest of the questions on, on Slack. I'll be in the room here for the next hour or so. Um, but yeah, thanks again. See you.